Hey there, and welcome to this week's episode of Lost Origins, your number one radio show for all things ancient mysteries, alternative historical theories, and lost civilizations. Make sure to check us out on the web at lost-origins.com, and you can also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. Make sure that you hit that subscribe button, that way you never miss an episode or an article from Lost Origins. This week's episode is brought to you by Inner Traditions and Baron Company. Inner Traditions has been publishing books on esoteric philosophy, New Age spirituality, and alternative health for well over 40 years. Visit innertraditions.com to learn more about their books and authors and to sign up for catalogs, coupons, and special offers. Inner Traditions offers a massive, massive catalog, and their books are authored by some of the top researchers in the field. So pick up one of their books today. I promise you will not be disappointed. We have really enjoyed working with Inner Traditions and Baron Company here at Lost Origins. All right, folks, I cannot even begin to explain how excited I am for this week's show. This week, we're going to be chatting with history and science writer Andrew Collins. Andrew has authored several best-selling books, including Gateway to Atlantis, From Ashes of Angels, Gods of Eden, and most recently, Gobekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods. Uh, Andrew also has various tours coming up to some of the sites that he talks about in the book, including Gobekli Tepe, uh, rolling out this May and October. So for full details, make sure you check out his website at andrewcollins.com. Uh, Today, we're going to be discussing uh, his views on the ancient megalithic site of Gobekli Tepe, as well as some of his theories as to the purpose of the ancient site right after the break. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and we are back. Uh, Like I said today, we have the outstanding privilege of welcoming Andrew Collins to today's episode of Lost Origins. Uh, For over 25 years, Andrew has been a dominant authority of ancient mysteries, paranormal phenomenon, ancient sites, and the human mind. He has authored droves of best-selling books, including Gateway to Atlantis, From Ashes to Angels, and most recently, Gobekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods, which we gave five solid stars in our review here on Lost Origins. Andrew has also appeared in several documentaries and television series, uh, including Ancient Aliens and World of Mysteries, The Lost City of Atlantis. In his latest book, Gobekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods, Andrew documents the importance of the ancient site. He presents his research and personal experience with the site, as well as the archaeoastronomical connection found at Gobekli Tepe. So, all the way from England, it is my pleasure to welcome Andrew Collins to the show today. Andrew, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you, Andrew. Two Andrews talking together about the mysteries of life. Absolutely. I think it won't get too confusing as our accents are, are so different. So, <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so Andrew, your work ranges uh, from, from in, in basically we have a lot of diverse topics that you have covered throughout your career. Um, can you share a little bit about what what you got what got you into uh, researching ancient mysteries and, and uh, paranormal phenomenon and, and what led you down the path uh, to become the author and researcher that you are today? Yes, I, I think that my career in this business began when I was about probably five or six years old. Um, and I shared an interest with uh, you know other school friends in the mysteries of life, uh, everything from ghosts to you know to poltergeist to dreams to astral projection and things like this. Sure. And um, you know I, I, I wanted to do all this. I mean I wanted to investigate it. I, I even tried to get books out of the library which I could hardly even, carry let alone read right and it wasn't until i got to um what we call junior school um, which is at the age of 11 that i started to realize that um that 
other people did not share the same ideas um, and that, you know, you had one or two maybe core friends that, that, you know, did, you know, have the sort of interests the same as you, but everybody else did not believe. Sure. But they didn't stop me and I started to read um, mostly books about UFOs, I think, in, in the early days. Mm-hmm. Um, and the UFOs turned to sort of like paranormal mysteries and the paranormal mysteries turned to ancient mysteries. Um, and obviously there are a number of authors that were writing about these sort of subjects. Um, in particular, obviously, um, Eric von Daniken. Uh, and I remember reading uh, Chariots of the Gods when I was um, a teenager. Mm-hmm. Um, and this sort of blew my mind. And uh, although I probably questioned a lot of his ideas about the idea of, of aliens, you know, having some... Uh, part in our uh, human evolution, I still thought that he raised important questions uh, about, you know, why was the the Great Pyramid built, you know, um, or the Nazca Lines in Peru, or, you know, who were the Sumerians? Did they have any contact with extraterrestrial intelligences? You know, these these questions made me think. Um, And although for the first few years I concentrated my own investigations um, on UFOs, writing reports that got longer and longer and longer for things like the um, the, the British UFO Research Association, sure. where I eventually ended up becoming almost like this troubleshooter investigator, going around the country investigating some of the, the key cases that would come up. This gave me the working experience. Um, and then I went on to a magazine called Strange Phenomena, um, which was very short-lived, but again gave me all of the uh, the knowledge and experience to be able to put stories together, to get them published. Um, and then that was helped by actually joining a, a local paper um, where I live in, in Essex in uh, South East England. Um, and all these skills were crucial for when I started properly investigating the ancient mysteries because... I did what most people would do, and that's write and publish your own material. And I think the first um, book I did was probably about 250 copies, which I sold. Then the next one was 500. The next one was 1,500, 2,500. Until the book after that, I did 15,000 copies um, and filled my entire flat with copies and put them in the back of a car and went around shops selling them. Uh, until they'd all gone. Um, And that uh, attracted the interest of major publishers um, back in the the late 1980s now. Um, And I was taken on by Random House, um, and they took me on for a few books, and from that point onwards, really, I've not looked back, I suppose. I mean, and since that time, I've had, I think, probably about 15 books, um, almost all of those uh, internationally published uh, and obviously here we are, really. And, I, and I mean, going back to the 1980s, I mean, I was just investigating local mysteries, right. uh, local places in Essex. I never, ever thought that I would be going around the world investigating mysteries and writing books about it because I suppose in some ways that was almost more than a dream that I had when I was, you know, young. I I never thought I would ever be able to achieve something like that. So, you know, uh, somehow I have, and here I am talking to you. That's an incredible story. And and honestly, before the days of the Internet, being able to move that many copies independently, I think, is a testimony to the quality of work that you're putting out into the marketplace. I mean, today, you know, anybody can set up an e-commerce site and they can sell uh, whatever they want, really. Uh, So to be able to do it uh, on that scale uh, before the days of e-commerce and the web is just so impressive. Um, so what I'd like to do before we get into your latest book is uh, I thought it might be helpful to give some of our listeners a, a little primer on Gobekli Tepe. Uh, I, I know Gobekli Tepe spent uh, a good amount of time in the news lately, but maybe for some of our listeners who aren't incredibly familiar with the, with the site and the importance of the site, maybe you could give us some background uh, on the site from an expert's point of view. Indeed. Um... Well, it was discovered in 1994. Um, It it was already known about for at least two decades, Um, but 
the original investigation which had taken place in the uh, in fact as far back as 1963 um, the some American um, uh, archaeologists surveyors went to the site which is this huge occupational mound on the top of a mountain um, made of earth and uh, stones and chippings and debris which had been quite literally taken to the top of that mountain and placed there um, it was surveyed by these people from the University of Chicago and they found um, evidence of, of stone carvings and they were so sophisticated that the the uh, the people from Chicago put the whole thing down to a medieval or Byzantine cemetery, probably no more than a thousand years old. Uh, and this was despite the fact that the, the whole area was absolutely covered with hundreds and thousands of stone tools that were at least 10,000 years old and arguably as much as 12,000 years. You know, they seemed to ignore that fact and write the whole place off. Well, along comes a guy called Professor Klaus Schmidt, um, and he'd been working um, at another site in the area of Gebekli Tepe, which is in uh, what's today southeast Turkey. He was working at a site called Navali Chori, uh -huh. which is at the extreme northern end of the Shanlurfa province. That's the ancient city of Shanlurfa, or Edessa, as it was known in the Bible. And he'd been there when they'd uncovered um, this so-called cult building, um, with these weird pillars, um, with these anthropomorphic human-like fig figures um, actually on them, 12 within this square-shaped plan, um, and the remains of, of two others in the centre. Um, and he'd investigated these with a German archaeologist by the name of Harold Hoffman. Um, and this was a risk rescue dig because uh, they were building the Ataturk Dam um, on the Euphrates at this time. And they knew that the waters from the dam would eventually reach as far as this site called Navali Chori. So they were digging out whatever they could and preserving it. And then finally, around 1991, 1992, the lapping waters finally, um, you know, submerged Navali Chori and Klaus Schmidt, had nothing to do, so to speak. Right. Um, so he went looking for other sites of a similar age. Now, the Vali Chori probably dates to about 8,000 to 8,500 BC. So that's the sort of age that we're talking about here. And he heard about this place called Gebekli Tepe. He read the report that had been done by the University of Chicago and went to the site. And, of course, immediately he saw these fragments of stone carvings, which were sort of all over the place, really. I mean, the local farmers had been finding them and putting them on the top of stone walls because they didn't know what else to do with them. They tried to interest the local museum in the in the story who just, you know, ignored them completely. Um, and Klaus Schmidt realised what this was and that underneath this occupational mound, which is about 200 by 300 metres in size, and about 15 metres depth, that's about 45 feet deep, that there was something incredible here because it was just so large. Uh, and obviously you could see from the fragments of carved stone that it probably uh, included these cult structures, these enclosures or installations, as they, as they call them, um, and obviously put in a proposal to uh, the German Archaeological Institute that they would um, finance this, this um, expedition. Um, the local um, museum finally came on board, which is Chandlerfa Museum, um, and they got together and started excavations there in 1995 for the first time. Uh, and very soon they, they started uncovering these incredible stone enclosures, um, one after the other. And these consisted of these T-shaped stones that were set like spokes of a wheel uh, towards two massive twin central monoliths in the, in the middle of these enclosures. And these twin monoliths um, were anything up to five and a half metres, about 18 and a half feet, toll, weighing anything up to sort of 15 to 20 tonnes apiece. Uh, and just like the ones that had been found at Navali Chori, they had these strange bent arms on the side of the, the, the stems of the stones. 
which came around to the front, joined in hands. There was carvings all over the stones of different creatures of the natural world, everything from foxes to um, snakes to boars to bulls to spiders, scorpions, lots of different types of birds from uh, vultures to flamingos to flightless birds, possibly even a form of dodo, right. uh, an extinct bird. Um, and, you know, and it just kept coming. And, and every year they were uncovering more uh, of these enclosures. And gradually they obviously got down to the, the, the base of the uh, the mound. And they found that the, the, the largest and clearly the oldest and the most impressive of the structures were actually built onto the bedrock itself, um, where they'd actually carved an area first and slotted the stones actually into pedestals that had been purposely created and left behind, you know, a, a sort of area where the, the stones were actually slotted in. And some of these are even carved with animals themselves. And this is what they found. And, of course, they, they did carbon-14 dating, um, of materials, organic materials, which were found inside the retaining walls of these enclosures because not only do they have the standing stones, but around the standing stones are these walls which were original and were originally there. And they have like these low benches that also sort of come out like steps from the walls. And the dates that were produced for the oldest of the enclosures was around 9,700 to 9,300 BC, with an average around 9,400 9, BC, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and the youngest of the enclosures, which were also the smallest and the simplest, which were obviously much higher up in this layer cake-like occupational mound, these dated to around 8,500 to 8,000 BC. So you can see what they were doing. They built the oldest and the best first. And when they had fallen out of use, they covered them over with stone chippings, debris, earth that had been imported from the plains below and covered them over completely as if to decommission them. Mm -hmm. And they built new ones on top. And they kept doing this until they reached the top of the mount. And then finally around 8,000 BC, for whatever reason, and it's a matter of speculation, they covered the whole thing up and just left it and went off and probably, you know, continued their work in other parts of the ancient world because obviously this now marks what's known as the Neolithic Revolution, right. that the origins of agriculture, the origins of animal husbandry, uh, you know, rearing, breeding animals and things like this. And this is something that then spreads like a wave or a fashion of activity northwards into Iran and Tur Turkestan, southwards and southeastwards down into the Indus Valley and obviously southwestwards into the Levant, Palestine, Syria and eventually into Egypt and, of course, westwards into other parts of Turkey, places like Çatalhöyük, where you have this ancient city complex going back to about 7,000 BC, and beyond that into Bulgaria and other parts of Europe, and of course all over the place eventually. This is the foundations of our own religion, sorry, our own civilization, right. and yes, indeed, religion as well, because obviously the holy books, you know, the Bible, the Quran, um, the, the Torah, all talk about this point of foundation. Uh, they call it the Garden of Eden. And all of the evidence seems to point to the fact that the area around Gebekli Tepe um, and the mountains just to the east of there are the original Garden of Eden, the place where the four rivers of paradise take their rise um, and eventually go out into the different directions. Uh, and, of course, it's from this area also that the forerunners of the Sumerians the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Akkadians come from as well. So really this is the cradle of civilization, certainly for the ancient world. I mean, obviously there are other things going on in places like China and obviously in the, you know, the North America and probably other places as well, but certainly for the traditions that we see as connected with our religious background through the Bible and through our parents and our parents' parents, whatever, this 
is where it all began. There's no question about that at all. And if it hadn't have been for Klaus Schmidt, we may never have seen Gebekli Tepe because um, the actual mountain side that it's actually perched upon was scheduled to be demolished to supply um, uh, road masonry uh, for the new highway that was being built between Chandlerfe and Marden. So there is a chance uh, that we may never have seen this site, and that would have been a very tragic um, story if that had been the case, because we'd have been completely in the blind about this very strange culture that existed right at the end of the last ice age. And it's it's incredible that it was found though, and and how lucky we really are, because like you said, without this, we we would have it, we'd be hard pressed to find any connection to the the end of the last ice age, um, or we'd be waiting for somebody to stumble upon. Uh, something equally as old. So uh, I know that this is a, a very loaded question, um, and it's something that um, is is open to speculation, I suppose. But um, you know, it's often said that Gobekli Tepe is the most important ancient site uh, on the face of the earth right now, right? Um, so based on your research, Andrew, who do you think built this, and why? Well, I think you are right that it is the most important archaeological site in the world right now. Um, I suppose if we discovered the Great Pyramid tomorrow, that, you know, clearly it would become that or, you know, anywhere else, you know, perhaps next year it could be Tutankhamun's tomb because obviously we know probably now that there is a secret chamber that's going to be revealed. But as far as the origins of everything is concerned, yes, it's Gebekli Tepe. And certainly as far as my life is concerned, my whole world revolves around that place uh, mm-hmm. the, these days, you know, whether it be visiting it there, investigating it, or writing about it, which I'm doing once again as we speak. So, um, but who actually constructed it? Well, first we have to look at the time frame. The earliest of the enclosures there, the installations, as the archaeologists like to call them, is around 9,600 BC. And this is a very important date because this marks the end of a 1200 or 1300 year period known as the Younger Dryas. Now, the Younger Dryas is essentially a mini ice age, Mm -hmm. um, a cold spell, um, the climatologists like to call it, and where temperatures dropped probably as much as, as, as 10 degrees C over large parts of the Northern Hemisphere. And what this did was to make the um, the ice flows, um, which had been gradually retreating before the time of this Younger Dryas, um, over a period of a couple of thousand years, there was been quite a warm period before, and they suddenly went back to where they were. In other words, something was causing the world to become very, very cold again. Now, what exactly happened? Well, it seems as if at the beginning of that Younger Dryas, a date of around 10,800 BC, there was a massive cataclysm involving the fragmentation of a comet, uh, which devastated large parts of the Northern Hemisphere, mm-hmm. both on the Eurasian continent, but also, most, and in fact, mostly, Um, on the North American continent, but also in South America and Central America as well. And this was something that devastated the world and probably uh, caused as much as 75% of the human population to be decimated. Um, It also caused mass floods. It caused um, the blocking out of the sun, the moon and the stars for a very long period of time, perhaps months, perhaps even years. Um, and it also caused uh, changes of flow uh, within the ocean currents, all of which happened very rapidly within a generation or so to bring about this mini ice age. Um, And during this time, of course, the ice reached further south, so all of the people who were existing in the Northern Hemisphere and had been, you know, happily basking in this newfound sun suddenly had to pack their bags and move away, obviously following the herds, following, um, you know, their sources of food. Um, And many of them obviously went towards the south. And 
Gebekli Tepe exists on the Euphrates, or very close to the Euphrates, in the area of what's today southeast Turkey. Well, if you go to the northeast of there, you'll come to the area that's known as the Caucasus. Um, before that, you'll come to the Armenian highlands, um, which is the place of Armenia. Armenia was a huge, great kingdom that existed in this area um, right up until relatively recent times. But you've got the Armenian highlands, you've got the Caucasus, and they, they are um, uh, bound on each side by seas. To the west, you've got the Black Sea, and to the east, you've got the Caspian Sea. And this forms like a, a funnel or a channel for people that if they're coming down from the north, from the Russian steppes, um, what they call the, east, the, the, the Eastern European Plain, they have to be funneled through this area. And if they do, they'll come out of that funnel in the area of either eastern or southeastern um, Turkey. And I think there is good evidence to suggest that some of the peoples that existed uh, on the Russian steppes um, and in parts of Europe, probably even as far east as the Carpathians, um, may well have infiltrated their way all the way down into the area of um, southeastern Turkey. Mm. Um, and probably they they did this not by just coming in and just bashing on the head everybody that was around, but I think that probably it was a case of, um, you know, taking over trade routes, taking over the control of uh, various um, fine sites of things like obsidian, which was a, a very prized and very important exotic material used to make stone tools and, you know, arrowheads and things like this. Uh, and all of this was taking place towards the end of the Younger Dryas, basically. And I think that what happened was that quite a large number of these groups of people who archaeology refers to as the Swiderian, simply sure. because of their, their, the, the type style of the, uh, the, the stone tools that they manufactured. And actually, Swidery, the place where their name comes from, is actually as far west as, as, as Poland. But their style of manufacture of tools spread from... Poland and the Carpathian Mountains, eastwards all the way to the Urals, um, which is the border area between Europe and Asia. Um, and, uh, yeah, they, these were very, very sophisticated people. They had incredibly sophisticated stone tool technology, and they were descendants of even earlier and much more important sophisticated groups known as the, the Salutrians and also the Gravatians. And these were people who had the most incredible cult to do with the, the mother goddess. They had um, lunar orientated sites. They had agriculture. They had tailored clothing. Um, they had astronomical stuff. They had, you know, all sorts of stuff as, er as early as perhaps twenty five to 30,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and they were essentially based in two areas, within the area of central Russia, but also to the west in what is today the Czech Republic. Um, and these were people who were highly advanced and, you know, perhaps thousands of years ahead of, of everybody else in the game at that time in the ancient world. And the Swiderians were their descendants, there's no question about that. And I think that their influence is present at Gebekli Tepe. But I don't think that they necessarily got their hands dirty. Um, I think that the people that did actually manufacture the stones, did the carvings, were probably local people. Uh, and I would not count discount the fact that there were probably other influences that came to bear on Gebekli Tepe, probably coming in from the area of the Levant, from the south, you know, the area which is today Israel, Palestinian territories, um, Syria, Lebanon, etc. Sure. But also, perhaps, as my colleague Graham Hancock has suggested, there may have even been influences coming in from much further afield. Um, you know, he suggests the area of Southeast Asia, uh, which was uh, a, a, an area that sank called Sunderland, uh, and he could even be right there. I mean, you know, we don't know exactly what the melting pot was, and it is possible that somewhere like um, 
Gebekli Tepe could have been a, a, a cosmopolitan site with influences coming in from different um, territories, mm -hmm. you know, with all the people clubbing together and creating these incredible structures of which there may have been 20, 30, maybe even 50 on this mountain top. Uh, because although at the moment they have at least uh, well, about 10 different enclosures uncovered, um, geo radar surveys suggest that there are at least another 20, maybe even up to 50 different enclosures still to be found. They've only touched the surface, so to speak, right. of the occupational man. There's much more to be done yet. So who knows what will be discovered right. as time goes on. And I'm so glad that you brought up the Swadirians because uh, you, you focus on them in the book. And, and before reading your book, uh, that, that was a group of peoples that uh, I'd never even heard of before, right? And so it was really, really fascinating to uh, read your research and, and kind of follow their migration patterns and, and how it ties in to the mystery that is Gobekli Tepe. Another thing in the book that you spend a good amount of time detailing is uh, the, the archaeoastronomy found at the site uh, and the site's connection to the constellation of uh, Cygnus, more, more specifically. Can, can you give us uh, an explanation of this connection and then also the importance of this finding? The first time I went to Quebec Tepe was in 2004. Um, I was lucky enough to be invited um, to a big cultural festival at Diabakar, which is the the, the administrative centre of um, that part of southeast uh, Turkey. Um, and as part of the deal, as it were, um, I was given a driver and an interpreter. And I said, look, you know, I, I need to see some of these sites that I, I write about. I mean, I'd never been to that part of the world before. And they said, fine, you know. So I, I was able to go to Quebec Tepe for the first time. Um, and there was no one there. I mean, the, the only people that we saw was uh, the local farmer uh, and his son who came over to, to say hello. And they gave... Um, us the story about them finding these these pieces of carved stone um, and said how they'd taken them to the local museum and the local museum had promised to send somebody out but never did. And the stones at that time were basically still half buried. Um, you know, I mean, some of the enclosures were fully excavated, but some of the big, beautiful ones that we see today, uh, only half of the, the, the stones had been, you know, revealed from, from the actual... Um, you know, debris and earth and all the rest of it below. And I remember staring at this and spending a lot of time there and just thinking, what the hell was going on in these people's minds? I mean, I knew that it, these, this site dated to at least 9,000 BC. And this was the first time that I'd really seen these, well, one of these sites that I'd, I'd been writing about. I mean, because I'd, I'd written about uh, Navali Chori in a book called um, Gods of Eden back in 1998, as early as that, um, and, and try to understand, you know, who this culture was and their place and the origins of civilization and things like this. But, and this really bugged me what these people were into. But one of the other sites that we went to um, on that same little journey was the ancient city of Haran. Um, now, it's only about 25 miles from Gebekli Tepe. It's on the so-called Haran Plain, um, and the Gebekli Tepe can be actually seen from Haran, well, certainly on a very fine day, I would say. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing about Haran is that this is well known as not only the origin point for Hermetica, you know, the, the ancient teachings of, of Hermes, which are obviously attributed to the ancient Egyptians and probably do come in part from Egypt. But the people that live there, the so-called Sabians, um, also known as the Chaldeans or the Haranites, were star worshippers. They venerated the stars. They venerated the planets. They had one of the earliest forms of astrology, and I mean a real strict, complex astrology, and there are various books that are left today which, you know, give the systems of astrology that, that the Sabians left. And these people knew the heavens better than 
anybody. There's no question about this at all. And the interesting fact is that although they were very much aware of the seven planets and saw them as, as gods or indeed goddesses, uh, they were aware also of the, the 12 signs of the zodiacs and saw them as celestial personifications as well. Their greatest and their oldest god was the personification of the north. His name was Shamal, which just means actually the north, basically. Oh. Um, and they venerated the north and the north star as the place of the primary cause, uh, the place of heaven uh, and the place quite clearly where the souls came from and would return to in death, just in the same way that Christians and, and other uh, monotheistic religions see the place of the rising sun as the direction of heaven. And that's, of course, in the east, which is obviously the direction that we point our churches towards for this very reason, because that's the place where the resurrection of Christ and you know the resurrection of all those that are dead, if you obviously believe in Christianity, will rise up and, and go to heaven on judgment day. But the Heranians, or the Heronites, the Sabians, the Chaldeans, they venerated the north. And this gave me a few ideas as well, because in some of their festivals, which they venerated the north, in fact, every year they had this long celebration known as the Mystery of the North, they would actually release birds into that direction. And birds are very often the symbol of the soul. And that I began to wonder whether some of these ideas at Haran had actually come from Gebekli Tepe, where there are a large number of depictions of birds, in particular vultures. Right. Now, I'd already written two books up to this point that had talked about the Neolithic cult of the dead, uh, which the main symbol of which was the vulture. And the vulture was important to these people because it was involved in the practice of excarnation. And this is the disposal of dead bodies by placing them out onto so-called excarnation towers. They're just like these wooden frames, you know, that would be sort of built quite high. And the bodies would be put on the top of them and the birds would come down, the vultures to start with, but then later, once they'd had their fill, other smaller birds like blackbirds, you know, like crows and ravens, things sure, like this would sure. then come down. There was a pecking order, quite literally, on, on you know, on, and it still is today, strangely enough. These so-called sky burials still take place in the Himalayas. You, I mean, if, if, if any of your listeners wants to check out excarnation, just put excarnation in Google uh, or whichever... Uh, search engine you use, um, and you'll get some very gruesome pictures come up from the Himalayas right. actually showing human bodies being pecked clean of, of their flesh by, um, by vultures in the modern day. Well, this was going on at the time of Gebekli Tepe. And the thing was is that because of this and because, obviously, you were putting these bodies out and then the next time you were going there, all that was left were these bones, a connection came about between the fact that the vultures were somehow taking away some part of that human existence. And it would seem that in some manner, the vultures came to be seen as taking away the souls of the deceased into the afterlife. Uh, and this can be found not only at, at Navali Kori, but also Gebekli Tepe, where Professor Klaus Schmidt, the late Klaus Schmidt, he died in 2014. Right. Um, and also uh, places like Chatelhoyak, the city complex um, in southern central uh, Turkey, there are a lot of images that show excarnation taking place. It was obviously a very big thing for these people. This is how they disposed of their dead. And their beliefs and practices revolved around this cult revolving around the vulture. Mm -hmm. um, so to find the vulture so prominently displayed at Gebekli Tepe got me thinking 
I wonder whether the vulture has got something to do with the directionality and the, 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 of, of the beliefs of the people at Gobekli Tepe. So, and all this was, you know, coming out just a, a, a day or two after I actually returned from southeast Turkey. I mean, I just couldn't get this subject out of my mind. This was back in 2004. Mm -hmm. And I, so I started to look at some sky law of um, the Near East. And when I found that the constellation of Cygnus was seen anciently as a vulture, uh, not only on the Euphrates, but also in Armenia, which is a neighbouring country today, but in the past, it actually embraced the area of Shanlurfa and Gebekli Tepe, mm. that I started to realise that I could be onto something and that it was possible that Cygnus was seen by these people as perhaps a place of origin of the soul, perhaps their place of the primal cause, and that somehow these ideas had eventually come down to the, the Sabians. Um, uh, 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 nearby Haran. Mm -hmm. And so as the enclosures were uncovered, um, bear in mind to say this was 2004, there was no real um, publicly, you know, re released plan of it up there. I mean, it wasn't until I think probably 2005 that the first one um, really appeared. Sure. Um, that we started to realise that the orientations of the main enclosures was directly towards the constellation of Cygnus in the northern sky. Now, Cygnus is obviously not the pole star. The pole star that we have today is Polaris, and Polaris is in the constellation of Ursa Minor. Mm -hmm. However, what's interesting is that in the millennia before Gebekli Tepe, not at the time, but from about 16,500 to around 14,000 BC, the pole star had been in the constellation of Cygnus. Right. Um, and there's evidence from Paleolithic sites around the world, most particularly from caves in southern France, that suggest that, the, that they venerated the pole star and saw some kind of bird connected with it as early as that time. Well, that bird is unquestionably... Cygnus, right? Because it is the celestial bird, uh, or certainly the, the main one. I mean, there, there are others, but this seems to have been their, their main focus of attention. And so I gradually put the whole story together and obviously checked other things as well. You know, these other celestial birds. Um, I had a chartered engineer, a friend of mine by the name of Rodney Hale, check exactly all of the axial alignments of the different enclosures. Mm -hmm. And we conclu concluded that they were all, or all the main ones, aligned to the setting of the brightest star of Cygnus, which is Deneb. Um, and that the all, what you did was you would come up the mountainside, you'd come across these enclosures, you would enter them from the south, where they had their entrances, you would go into them, you'd, you'd see all of the, the, the stones around you, and you'd see in front of you these incredible twin central monoliths. You'd walk between these central monoliths, and in two of the largest enclosures, C and D, uh, and in fact, uh, recently, a, a new one that's been uncovered, this is also the same, which is enclosure H, is that they've got these st extra standing stones which are actually side on. They face, their, their, their widest face faces towards the centre and they've got these, cir these circular apertures within them like big bored stone holes mm -hmm. within the centre of them. And these originally, I mean the one in Enclosure D is still in position, you would have been able to stare through the central monoliths through this hole to the local horizon where you would have seen the setting of Cygnus around 9,500 BC. Wow. And although these are my ideas and the ideas of 
my engineer colleague, um, they were recently independently verified by Italian academics that have published this in a peer-reviewed um, journal. So, Fantastic. you know, that, that's, that's that. And I mean, you know, some of my colleagues, you know, wish to believe that uh, Quebec Tepe is facing the south towards the stars of Orion. Um, however, we've checked very closely the alignments towards Orion, towards Sirius, towards the Pleiades, towards all other possible candidates that have been put into the arena, mm -hmm. and none of them work whatsoever for this time period. Um, and it's quite clear that these monuments are facing towards the north. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is geared for you to enter in from the south, walk between the twin monoliths, which... Um, which are facing, you know, towards you as you as you walk towards them. I mean, it's like if you walk into a church. If you can imagine that an altar in a church is at the eastern end. Now, this is the Holy of Holies. Um, now, you you obviously don't walk in from the east. You come in either from the south or from the west, right. generally, and you walk into a church, and right at the other end is the altar. And you then walk through the aisle and you'll be looking from left and to right and you'll see the statues of Jesus and Mary and the angels and they're looking down at you. Mm -hmm. You walk at the altar and there may be a statue of Jesus on the left. You know, you know what I'm saying? Right. These aren't looking towards the, behind you towards the west. They're looking at you because it's meant for an emotional connection to be made between you and these statues and the imagery that you see sure. to bring you into a, a state of reverence mm -hmm. towards what is taking place here, which is entering you know, the house of God. And in many ways, this is exactly what was going on at Gebekli Tepe, 9,500 BC. But instead of the altars, they had these weird portal stones with, with the with these circular apertures in the middle of them. They took the place of the Holy of Holies. Why were they important? Because in shamanic tradition, right the way across the Eurasian continent, shamans saw holes either within natural things like trees or rocks or poles or within... Uh, purposely carved, um, you know, items that they bored holes through. These would be points of contact between this world and the next world. Mm -hmm. um, they were points of access. And for some reason, it was believed that you had to go through a hole to, re to reach this. Even within yurt um, tents, you know, within places like Siberia and Central Asia, these holes in the top of the tents were seen to be representations of the exit from this world and the point of entry into the next world. And somewhere like Gebet Tepe is a place of shamans. There's no question about this at all, probably a lot of them. Sure. Um, and, of course, the big question then comes, well, what the hell were they doing there? Right. You know, I mean, why, why would you actually build something like this in the first place? And what I try to show in the Quebec de Tepe book, is that this was right at the end of the last ice age, right at the end of the Younger Dryas period, when you'd had this incredible turmoil in the world caused through this cataclysm, which wasn't just one single instant, by the way. There was fires and other, you know, huge tremors and other cosmic events going on for several hundred years. Yeah, for years. And also it's almost certain that something brought the end of the Younger Dryas period to a close within a generation. And that could also have been another cosmic event. Um, you know, catastrophists who have looked into this do believe that something else happened at the end. So you got something else happening just before they begin the construction of Quebec de Tepe. And what I argue in the book is that at this time, the people of southeast Turkey were still in a state of turmoil. They still suffered from what 
the, the visionary writer Barbara Han Klo referred to in one of her books, or actually the title of her book as well, Catastrophobia. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, it, it, it could almost be something that you could go to a psychologist with or a psychoanalyst and say, look, I've got this problem. I, I have this big fear that a catastrophe is going to happen. You know, can you cure me? And this is catastrophobia. Right. And this, I think, is what half of the population of the Northern Hemisphere were suffering at this time. And they needed something to cure their problems. And that cure was people coming along. And I believe that they were Swiderian peoples, probably working with other local cultures in that area that said, came along, they said, hey, don't worry, we're going to sort it all out. All you've got to do is just listen to what we've got to say. Mm -hmm. We want you to build these enclosures and these buildings will be interfaces between this world and the next so that every time a comet comes along, our shamans will be able to instantaneously go into a trance state, an alter state of consciousness, project their minds into the sky world and deal with the supernatural creatures that they would have seen as responsible for bringing these comets into the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a fact that even until, you know, the, the, the age of discovery in the Americas, for instance, that a number of the indigenous cultures, every time a comet would appear in the sky, certain rituals had to take place, right. um, including the wearing of um, foxes' tails. And foxes' tails is universally seen as a symbol of the tail of a comet. Mm -hmm. And, of course, what do we have on the two largest central monuments, mon monoliths at right. Gebek uh, Tepe, but these, these anthropomorphic figures in abstract form wearing these foxes' tails. Right. Um, plus there are other symbolism there that suggests uh, connections with comets, and, and I think that that's what was going on. These were almost like places where the threat that was perceived to be coming from comets was dealt with at that time. But I don't think that that was the sole reason. I mean, quite clearly there was a relationship between the beliefs of the peoples, which is that we come from the stars and will return to the stars in death. And I don't mean in a physical sense. I mean, they weren't stupid. They obviously knew that they came from their mothers and their mothers came from their mothers and mothers. There was a whole line going back sure. to the first goddess, you know, the first mother, if you like. They, they weren't daft. They knew that we were born on Earth. But the soul was immortal. And I firmly believe that they thought that the soul came from a certain area of the sky and that area was in the area of the Cygnus constellation. Mm. And the other reason why that would be the case is because Cygnus is prominently displayed on the Milky Way, where the Milky Way breaks into two separate streams due to this dark stellar debris mm -hmm. right along what they call the galactic plane, the centre line mm -hmm. of the Milky Way. And this begins in the area of Cygnus, which is why this rift, as they call it, is known as the, it's known as the Great Rift, the Dark Rift, or the Cygnus Rift. Mm -hmm. And around the world, different cultures saw this rift as the place of birth of the sun or the place of origin of the human race itself. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a universal thing. Um, it's obviously found in different forms, uh, sometimes it's only associated with, you know, the, the, the kings or something like this. Sure. But in other areas, the whole human race. In other areas, it's place where the fairies were born. In other areas, it's where the gods were born. But it seems to be the place that people would look at and say that that's where we came from. Right. And that's where we will return in death. Wow. And... I wish we had more time, Andrew. Um, you, you, truly, you are just grazing the surface of the, the wealth of knowledge and research that you present in the book. So um, for all of our listeners, and out, our listeners out there uh, looking to get a deeper dive into everything we've talked about today, and then also including um, the Watchers and, and uh, the Garden of Eden, uh, I strongly encourage you to pick up 
uh, Gobekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods by Andrew Collins. Uh, it is, is one of the best reads that I've had in a long time. So, uh, Andrew, before we wrap up, you, you do have another book at the publisher right now uh, focusing on Atlantis, I believe, and then you're also working on a sequel to the Gobekli Tepe book that you recently released. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, my book, Gateway to Atlantis, originally came out in the year 2000, um, has been revamped, and I've done a new uh, beginning, a new end to it. Uh, that's coming out, in theory, probably October this year, I think, but they've changed the name to uh, Atlantis in the Caribbean mm-hmm. and the Comet that changed the world. Wow. There you go. And then so, the, the uh, next... they like long titles there. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. <laughs> and yeah, so you know, if if you've got Gateway to Atlantis, then just be prepared that, that it is that book. But if you haven't got that, then look out for it. Basically, what it shows is that the best candidate in the world for the remaining segment of Atlantis, Plato's Atlantis, is in the area of Cuba. And that the sunken areas, the sunken lands of Atlantis are around the Caribbean and the Bahamas. And that there is incredible material that's been discovered underwater even since the publication of that book. And the whole story is brought out within Atlantis and the Caribbean, which will be out later on this year. And as far as um, the sequel to Quebec, absolutely, yeah, I mean... It's a book that's constantly changing. I I don't want to give out too much of the uh, uh, away at the moment. Sure. But um, the one thing I can say is that it will feature one of the most incredible discoveries at Gobekli Tepe that's come out of the site in recent years, and that's a tiny, tiny bone plaque with with um, carvings etched into it that show two T-shaped pillars characteristic of those at Gobekli Tepe but what's so important is that it also has between those twin pillars not just a person but what appears to be one of these what we call soul hole stones you know one of these these um you know these porthole stones with the hole in it sure and above that are three deep peck marks in a line that match exactly the astronomical positions of the three wing stars of the constellation of Cygnus. Wow. The crossbar in the cross when Cygnus is seen in terms of the Northern Cross, which is its other name. Um, and this has changed everything. I mean, it, it's it's just turned everything on its head uh, and also obviously confirmed a lot of the work that I'd already brought out in Quebec de Tepe, Genesis of the Gods. Mm-hmm. So um, that's how basically the book will start, at least. Very and good. I know that because I've already written that. Book. Sure. The rest of the rest, the rest of it's still in my head, and I'm I hope to have it finished by the end of April. Very cool. So that's what we're doing. Do you have a tentative release date for that, or is that all? Up I don't. Okay. No, I mean I'll be honest. It probably is not going to hit the streets until next year. I sure. would say. Very good. Well, Andrew, uh, from all of us here at Lost Origins and on behalf of our listeners, I just want to extend uh, the most sincere of thank yous for joining us today. Uh, This has been an incredible conversation, and uh, we hope to have you back on the show uh, many times uh, in the future. So thank you so much for your time today. Uh, So that wraps up this week's episode of Lost Origins. I'm your host, Andrew. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. Make sure that you hit that subscribe button down below. Want to make sure that you're always in the know with all of the new episodes coming out, all of the new articles and book reviews on the site. Uh, You can also connect with us on almost every single social media platform out there. Uh, Make sure you check in with us next week when we're going to be sitting down with Joe Luciano, who was the primary binary decoder from the Rendlesham Forest incident. So you don't want to miss that. That's going to be a great show. Um, And until then, I'm Andrew and continue to question everything.